One is from a college student who asks, does a vast giant universe disprove God? Mm -hmm. And then the second one comes from someone called Isaiah who wants to know, is there any evidence for God outside of the Bible? And how can we know if this evidence is credible? Mm. That's great questions, and they are related. Um, uh, the second one actually has some aspects, not just, I think, of science, but also of history, because mm -hmm. one of the things we ask about is, there, is there evidence outside the Bible for Jesus, not only his existence, but what he did? Uh, and the answer to that question, both from a scientific perspective about God's existence and from a historical perspective about Jesus not only existing, but doing the things that the Bible said he did, is yes, there's excellent uh, evidence outside of that. So I'm going to answer that part first, and then come to the second part. So Isaiah, I'm going to answer your part first. Um, and the evidence that I, I saw, actually, this is something that I was challenging Christians on um, early on in my search. You know, it took nine years for me to become a Christian uh, from sort of bang to bullets. When I started um, to uh, investigate the faith, originally to knock it out, to basically say this is not worth believing and to challenge Christians as to why they believed what they believed and then show them that what I believed was actually true. Um, and I began to see some what uh, Al Gore would call inconvenient truths, uh, which is that there's plenty of evidence outside the Bible to not only believe that Jesus existed, but that he did what he said he did. And the Bible says he did. Now, I was a Muslim, so I believed in Jesus as a prophet, as someone who performed miracles, was born of a virgin and all these things. So I didn't necessarily need the proof of that, but I wanted to challenge even that belief because I wanted to believe it was true, not what was tradition. So I began to look and see the, for, the, for the evidence. And what we see is not only that the Bible itself is a reliable source document for the life in, of Jesus. In fact, most scholars will tell you the, the, the synoptic gospels and the gospel of John and the book of Acts um, are the primary source documents we have about what happened uh, in the life and times of Jesus of Nazareth in the first century. And they're very early sources as well. So I don't want to discount that because when we ask the question about things outside the Bible, the assumption being made is that because the Bible says it, it must therefore be biased. And therefore we need outside evidence to corroborate it. Otherwise, we're really uh, approaching it from a biased witness. So as a lawyer, I can tell you this. Whenever you put a witness on the stand, whenever you put a witness on the stand, there's always a perspective that that witness has. And that would, might, might seem to be bias, and you have ways of testing that through cross-examination, through verification, through corroboration. You want to find out if the witness is biased. But you don't assume the bias unless it's proven through extrinsic means. So what you need to do is find evidence outside the witness's testimony to find out if the witness is, is biased. So with the Bible, you don't approach the New Testament and say, I assume it's biased until proven otherwise. You assume it's not biased unless it's proven to be biased. I'll give you an example of this. If you were to take Holocaust survivors and ask them for their testimonies about what they went through in the death camps or what they went through in various concentration camps or when they were hidden uh, by Christians or by others in the homes when the Nazis were coming for them and you were to take their accounts and you were to hear the emotion-laden accounts and you were to see the tears, you were to see the trembling in the hands, would you assume they're biased? Well, they have an agenda, don't they? Well, of course they have an agenda. Maybe that agenda is to tell the truth based on the horrors that they actually faced. So you would automatically not assume that they were biased. You would see the emotion there, but you wouldn't question the veracity of their testimony unless there's reason to. I think the same thing is true of the Bible. Just because the eyewitnesses put their accounts into an orderly fashion for us to read doesn't mean that they're biased. It means that they may have recorded it the way it was supposed to be, that way. And you do see corroborating evidence outside the Bible for the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus, or at least the claims of that. So much so when you have Josephus, a Jewish historian, when you have Cornelius Tacitus, a Roman historian, when you have uh, 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 Pliny and you have other uh, historians outside who are hostile to the Christian faith, who are actually telling us that Christians not only claimed that Jesus died on the cross, but they were willing to die for the, f for the fact that they ascribed to Jesus as having risen from the dead. And that evidence is really strong. Evidence that I didn't want to be strong, but I found to be compelling enough to put my faith in Christ as someone who died on the cross and then rose from the dead to prove that when he died, he paid my debt. Because if he died and stayed dead, there's no reason to believe him. But if he died and rose, there's every reason to believe only him. And he says that about me, that I'm made in God's image and I'm worth dying for. And he did in fact do that. And I believe him because he rose from the dead. Guys who rise from the dead, they tend to have credibility. And that worked <laughs> in this instance as well for me to see that he had credibility. And the extra evidence outside the Bible from 
the Roman historians, from the Jewish historians, from those who were hostile to Christianity, at least admitting some very important facts, help me there. But this is one small facet of the gospel narrative. Um, it's the chief facet, but if you were to look at the existence of God and all the evidence that mounts there, I think it's pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. Time doesn't allow me to go into all of it, but let me just suggest a couple of things here, is that when we look at the way the universe is constructed, and we look at just, just our, our solar system, for example, our solar system, our planet happens to be in what's called the Goldilocks zone. It's just right for life. Mm -hmm. We're not too close to the sun, otherwise it'd be too hot and life couldn't form or wouldn't even be able to exist. Neither are we too far from the sun because it would be too cold and life wouldn't be able to exist because the liquid water wouldn't be as abundant, it would be frozen water, the bacteria wouldn't be able to interact the way they interact, life wouldn't be able to sustain and consume resources and reproduce and all these things. Our planet is exactly where it needs to be. Now, why is that? Because of the balancing act that's happening. When you look at our solar system and you see a gas giant the size of Jupiter, that planet pulls on us through gravitation. That planet pulls on us. So it pulls us just far enough away from our sun so we're not too close. But it's not big enough to pull us further away from our sun than we need to be so that we're not too far. We're exactly where we need to be in our solar system so that life can exist on this planet. Plus, that gas giant with its massive gravitation pulls in large debris from around the solar system and things that orbit us all the time big rocks, asteroids, meteorites, these kind of things that would smash into our Earth and destroy all life here. Yet the cosmic vacuum cleaner that I believe God has placed at just the right distance from our planet prevents extinction of life and allows us to live on this planet. That's just two facets, our distance from the sun and the existence of Jupiter. That's just two facets. Then you take into account the idea of the moon, the fact that the moon, our moon, our satellite, we only have one and it's abnormally large compared to its, to its main planet. Our moon, though small, is actually large compared to the body that it orbits. That allows for tides and for other gravitational issues that allow for life to exist and perpetuate on this planet. And it just so happens to be that our moon is the exact right size. Now, all this is telling me that the universe is engaged in a, in a, in a celestial dance. It really is. There is an amazing amount, and this is just, there's so many more things to tell you about but it's all engaged in a celestial dance. And our planets are far enough away from each other based on other facets of the universe. So for example, if I were to look at where our solar system actually is in our galaxy, you know, the, the Milky Way is a spiral armed galaxy. And we don't live inside a spiral arm, one of the big milky spiral arms. We don't live inside of that. We live in one of the dark spots in between the spiral arms. We're not too close to the center, otherwise we'd be destroyed, nor are we too far away. We live exactly where we need to live so that we can actually have a maximum view of the visible universe. That's remarkable because what are the odds that the only planet that has observers on it, like us, happens to be in the prime spot to observe things? It looks like, to quote, I think it was uh, uh, Hoyle, um, who said, someone's been monkeying with the physics. Mm -hmm. It looks like we're placed exactly where we need to be. Now, this goes back to the original question then. Does a vast universe disprove God? I go back to the end of the movie Contact. If you've seen this movie, it's basically, uh, it's, 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 the, it's the film version of a novel written by Carl Sagan, the, the agnostic. Carl Sagan was a scientist and he always wrestled with matters of faith and science. He always wrestled with these issues and I think in profound ways. And in the, the book, he has this character who's basically a surrogate for himself, uh, Ellie Arroway. She's sort of a dyed in the wool atheist, a skeptic, but she has an encounter with aliens essentially that she can't prove actually happened. And so people have to take her testimony on faith. Well, at the end of the story, she's, she's back from her encounter and she's giving a tour of the very large array of these satellite dishes that are trying to find extraterrestrial life. And she's giving a tour to these young kids. And the young kid asks her the question, the same exact question that's asked here. Um, uh, essentially, the kid asks, is there life out there? And she says to him, well, what do you think? And he says, I don't know. And she likes that. She's like, oh good, you're a skeptic, I like that. And she says, I'll tell you what though, the universe is bigger than anything anyone's ever imagined. So if it's just us, it seems like an awful waste of space. I remember thinking that's superficially, you know, sort of uplifting, but it's actually a little bit on the shallow side. Why would it be a waste of space? 
You see, when we think of evidence and we think of the universe and science and history, we tend to put God into this sort of very efficient box. Like if God exists, he would be an engineer who wouldn't waste space, who wouldn't do things extravagantly. He would do things exactly as efficiently as they need to be. Why would that be the case? Why would it be the case that a vast universe makes us insignificant and therefore means that this is all part of a big cosmic accident that didn't have us in mind? Or could it be the fact that this little pale blue dot exists as a, as a seemingly insignificant part of a vast universe that happens to have a gas giant and a yellow sun and other galaxies and other bodies within the universe pulling and pushing in a way that makes life on this universe, uh, sorry, on this planet possible so that we can look at the celestial heavens, this vast universe, and see that God is not just an engineer, he is also an artist who paints with a brush that is so extravagant because he wants us to discover the universe he created. The Bible specifically says in Proverbs 25 verse two, it is the glory of God to conceal a matter not so that we never find it, because it is the glory of kings to seek things out. Maybe the vast universe doesn't disprove God's existence. Maybe the vast universe proves God's generosity. Hmm. Hmm.